At this time, I'm going to invite Pastor Steve to come on up. And I just have to say that, you know, Pastor Steve, um, he leads a Bible study on Thursday nights. Um, those in our church that have not attended Thursday night, I hope you will soon. And, um, you know, Pastor Steve's going to bless us. He uh, always brings forth good word, always br uh, studies out what he's saying. And uh, thank you, Pastor Steve, for being a blessing. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'll tell you, you're a good-looking group. We've been sitting in the back pew, and all I've seen is the back of your heads all weekend. <laughs> it's good to see you're a good-looking group, and with smiles on your faces. I first want to say thank you very much to uh, Pastor Michael for uh, this opportunity to be able to speak to you this weekend, especially to be able to come up here into the pulpit during our worship service to share God's word. Um, Pastor Mike has truly been a blessing to our church, to, the, to the, the body of Christ, to the community of preterists, and all around the world out there on the internet. And we are truly grateful for his teachings, his preaching, his leadership. Uh, this church, I don't think, has ever seen a harder working pastor. And uh, as the weekend has been going along, I thought also while I was sitting in the back pew how Pastor Chandler would have been sitting here busting buttons uh, to see how the church has grown, to see how the church, with, from his infancy teachings of preterism to what it's become today, he, he, he would have been so proud. He would have been so happy to see that. Um, so that uh, I'd like to, again, just say thank you. And uh, when Pastor Mike asked me to come up and, and be able to speak to you this morning, I thought, wow, this is a great opportunity because I did pastor for a few years here and getting up each week and speaking and got used to that. But now I, I don't get that opportunity all that often, but I found this to be a great opportunity to be able to come up into the pulpit. But then it occurred to me this weekend is about revelation revealed. And to be quite honest with you, I am not a revelation guy. So many people will talk about beast and coming out of the sea and 666 and all these different images that we get. I'm not into that. I, I just, I don't have a heart for that type of study and learning about that. And, and when he, so I really had to pay attention this weekend. When everybody else got up to speak, I said, oh, I'll learn, I'll, I'll take notes, I'll, I'll uh, I'll see what's going on to be able to speak about it. It gave me an opportunity to learn about different things in the book of Revelation, which I am most grateful for all the teachings. But I always find it interesting that unless you have a good understanding of the first 65 books of the Bible, when you get to that 66th book, the book of Revelation, unless you have that good understanding, you're lost. You're in a whole different world. And, it, and it's, it's amazing how so many do put that aside, the first 65, in order to fasten their education, their doctrines, their teachings, all oh, their preaching, everything on one book of the Bible. Many Christians today believe that the Old Testament, well, that was for the Jews, and that, that's fine, but that's ancient times. That's not where we need to focus. We need to just strictly focus on the New Testament. Stay with the stories of who Jesus is and what he has done. And I don't want to diminish that one bit, but they do that to an exclusion of the Old Testament. And if you take the book of Revelation in isolation, if you take it as a separate, altogether separate book of prophecy, and what it means for us today, and that there's so many mysteries that need to be revealed, and then you completely disjoint it from the rest of God's Word. You can make it say whatever you want. You can go in any direction, and you can see what the constructs of man's mind can be. And we saw, I think, a, a little bit of an example of that yesterday, where the teachings just really, or the, the, the talk on, on Revelation was all over the place. And you can make it say whatever you want, and you can make up fantasies and stories that really diminish the glory, the honor, the praise that our Lord and Savior truly deserves for what he has done for us. And, and it, that's where it hurts, to see how 
the church at large will come up and teach on these things, the book of Revelation, and you can sit there and go, it has nothing to do with the salvation that's been provided for us. It has nothing to do with the life, the eternal life that's been given to us today. It was given to us from that first century on, and that they look at it and they diminish it by putting it aside and saying, no, it can't be. It has to be for the future. It can't be for us today. And it hurts. It hurts to see that within a church that should be vibrant, that should be alive, that should just cherish that relationship that we have with our Lord and Savior. And, it, and, and to see that our, our God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is victorious. That his kingdom was established. That he made it possible for us to be in that kingdom, to be in the body of Jesus today and to be able to bask in his glory and give him the honor for all that he has done. With all the outlandish statements that we hear about the book of Revelation, so many people hear those and put, put the whole Bible aside because it does sound like, like a fantasy story. It doesn't sound like reality. But yet, for those of us who know our Lord and Savior, who study his word and see it, it's true. It's something that we stand upon each and every time we talk about our God. We can profess that he is a faithful God and that he has accomplished all that he, has, that he has said he would do. I've heard it said throughout this, uh, about the book of Revelation that it's absolutely the end of the earth as well as the end of heaven. And only, only when he remakes them will they be perfect as though God failed the first time in what he had done. We hear of different stories in regards to beasts and creatures unknown that cause all sorts of trouble and havoc throughout the world. Whether it's going to be for a thousand years or seven years, it, 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 time like that doesn't matter so much, but, but then all of a sudden this, this entire city, this new Jerusalem is going to come down from heaven and hopefully plant itself on a brand new earth and that everything will be glorious then. Oh, brothers and sisters, to be in the Lord today, there's nothing more glorious. And an antichrist will come up and rule the world. Well, I, I, I've yet to find antichrist in the book of Revelation, but of course you have to put him in there and to make the story sound even more uh, fantastic. It's when you remove the book of Revelation from the other 60, 65 books and you discard the Old Testament and you deal with only the New Testament as though it were written for us only today. You can make it say and do whatever you wish. This morning I'd like to place the book of Revelation back into, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of of the story. I always loved hearing Paul Harvey on the radio. All right, would you please join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, as I have this opportunity to speak on behalf of your word, I pray that my words would fall aside, that your words would be embedded in the hearts and minds of those who hear, that your truths would be revealed, that the story of salvation and the glorious things that Jesus has done for us in, have been accomplished, that we treasure them in our hearts today and that we glory in them because of what you have done for us. Through your grace, by faith, we enter into you and we enter into your rest. We thank you, we praise you, and I ask, upon, uh, ask your blessing upon us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. That's my littlest, biggest fan. <laughs> that's my grandson, that's, that's why. Um, okay, so from the book of Genesis on, the entire book is about a relationship between man and God. And through that, he wor God works with man through covenants. Covenants simply defined as an agreement, usually for a formal agreement between two or more persons, to do or not to do something that's specified. A key element in knowing whether you, whether or not someone in the Bible is in good standing or in good relationship with God through that covenant 
is where they stand with God, their location. And what I mean by that is in Genesis 2, 7 and 8, uh, then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. The covenant between God and man was made there. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from, that, from it, you will surely die. In the garden, man had life. He had a relationship with God after God had breathed that life into his nostrils and he became that living being, God placed him into the garden. There was a particular location where God wanted man in order to fellowship with him, in that garden. And that's where they could walk in the cool of the day and be with one another and talk with one another. And they could have that intimate relationship. And they, as long as man did not break the covenant agreement. Well, we know what happened. We've been taught how Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when they did, they broke the covenant with God. And as a result, they died that very day. On closer examination of our scriptures, we see just right away in the next chapter, chapter 4, how Adam and Eve, when they, when they ate of that, or that they did not die physically. But when God gave that covenant agreement with them, he said, on the day that you eat of that fruit, you shall surely die. So it tells us that Adam and Eve continued to live many, many years after that. They had children, Cain, Abel, Seth, and, and others. So was, it, so was it that God lied to Adam? Or give him false information in order to say, the day that you eat of that fruit, you will surely die? Absolutely not. While Adam and Eve were positioned in the garden, and so long as they kept that covenant agreement in not eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they, were, they had life. But once they broke that covenant and cast out of the garden, away from God's presence, they died. There was a spiritual death. That relationship with God had been severed. They were cast out and could no longer enter into that garden to partake of the tree of life. It's a simple story, but, if, but it's a consistent story that follows through the rest of our Bibles. Genesis 3.24, So he drove the man out, and at the east end of the gar Garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. So here you have, in the Garden of Eden, in covenant with God, Adam and Eve had that relationship. They had life. They were cast out of the garden. They broke the covenant. The covenant was fractured between them. They were cast out. They died. That relationship that they had with the living God was severed. Now this may sound pretty elementary to most Christians, but I submit to you, that this concept is the most central concept throughout the rest of the, the Bible story. It is something that needs to be focused on as you continue through the biblical narrative, as Pastor Mike would say. And at this point, with them being cast out, is it, upon the, is it incumbent upon man to find his way back into the garden to partake of the tree of life? Or will it be God's plan? Will it be his salvation? Will it be his redemptive history that he puts forth that brings man back into the garden, that brings man back into relationship with him, allows him to eat from the tree of life? It would be the work of God. Another clue that should be held fast throughout the rest of the scriptures is in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 46. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. 
as God begins his plan of redemption through salvation, restoration of sinful, dead people, back into fellowship with himself, giving them a resurrection, giving them life for those who were dead. One of the first uh, calls for this endeavor we see with Abram in Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. Abram and Sarai and Lot, they set out to find the land of Canaan and in 12, 5 and 6, 5 through 7, thus they came to the land of Canaan. Now the Canaanite were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants I will give this land. You would think that if they were given the land and they, they were there, stationed right there on that piece of, of, of property, real estate, that the story would be over. But there is still a lot more to come because it really wasn't about one particular geographic location. God said to him though, to your descendants I will give this land. And I think give is a very important word here because for instance, if I were to give you a car but it came in a box all in pieces, every piece all disassembled, giving you a car in a box, saying, here, I'm giving you a car, and no manual had to, had to put it together, it's not really giving you anything. But he said, I will give you a land. Because he brings Abram, and, and later on he'll bring Joshua and, and so forth, into a piece of property but they're going to have to conquer that property. They're going to have to work hard at being able to, to hold on to that land. There'll be threats all along. Abram didn't set his tents right there and said, home sweet home, I'm done, this is great. Because there was never any peace, joy, nor righteousness found in that particular land. They faced famine, strife, conflict. Uh, eventually, Abram calls out to God, in chapter 15, verse 2. O oh Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? God took Abram outside in verse 5. Now look towards the heavens and count the stars if you are able to, able to count them, so shall your descendants be. God made a unique covenant with Abram that day in chapter 15 when he asked Abram to take the animals and cut them in half and placing the two halves on either side. The way they made covenants and agreements back then, the two parties making establishing the covenant would pass between the two halves that, that the blood from the ground might get on their feet and basically saying that if I break this covenant, allow what happened to these animals to happen to me. But on that day, when God asked Abram to place those pieces, it was only God who had passed between the two pieces in the form of a smoking oven and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. It was incumbent upon God to fulfill this covenant that he has made with Abram and his descendants. It, the, all conditions were upon God. From that point on, as you read the rest of the story about the law and the prophets, the story does seem to be about one particular piece of geographic land. The struggle over this one place in the Middle East that a nation could set itself in and, 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 and uh, be established. But they were taken into slavery for 400 years and brought out. God then uses Moses to bring them up out of Egypt to wander through the wilderness for 40 years, still not possessing a land. It requires Joshua to bring the people across the Jordan into what, was, what we consider the promised land. And even that had to be taken from others who lived there. The fact that they were just standing across on the other side of the river did not provide for them peace, joy, and righteousness. Rather, they were faced with more conflict, battles, wars, struggles, fights amongst themselves. Whatever, wherever the Israelites were, whenever the Israelites were stable on a particular piece of land, or in a piece of land on a piece of land that God had told them about, 
they found themselves in the presence of God and very much alive in relationship to God. They would call upon, upon God to shine his face upon them. They knew that at that point they had favor with God and that they were in good standing. But yet, each and every time they would break a covenant, they would break the law, they were cast away, they considered that as being dead. Under King David, the Israelites had possession of a physical piece of land. They had established the 12 tribes. They became one nation under one king. And you would think, okay, now they have it. It's, it's all set. The rest, you don't need any more. They, they, they have that piece of property that God had told them about. You think all things were fulfilled. But that was not the case. When Solomon, his son, takes over and becomes king, that lasts for about 40 years, but then the kingdom divides. And from that division, then there was others who came in, one after another, ruling over the, the Israelites. You had the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, Greeks, then the Romans. The same principles apply from the very beginning. When they stood in the land and they had the presence of the tabernacle or the temple, the Israelites were in, in fellowship with God. They considered themselves alive in the presence of God. And when it was, came upon their rebellion and God's wrath came upon them, it was then that they realized that they had sinned, they'd broken the law, and in that, cast away from either the tabernacle or cast away from the temple in exile when the Babylonians came in, they faced death. There was not that living relationship with God. I know. At this point, you're saying, what does that have to do with the book of Revelation? And that's why I came this weekend to learn about why it has to do with the book of Revelation. But when the Messiah, the anointed one of God, came, Jesus, born a Jew to the tribe of Judah, fulfilled all the prophecies that were listed throughout the Old Testament in regards to who the Messiah would be. Yet, in John 1.11, he tells us, He, Jesus, came to his own, the Jews, and those who were, were his own did not receive him. Today, we have the complete word of God. We have so many resources that we can study from. We have computer programs that can list out in so many different languages. So many ways of looking at God's Word. We have dictionaries. We have concordances. We have so much. Seminaries, colleges, discussions, Bible studies. However, allowing the, the, the text of the Scripture to remain in context with the Scripture seems to be the hardest thing. It seems that most seminaries, Bible schools, preachers, so, teachers, so on and so forth, like to disjoint a lot, of the con a lot of the text of the scriptures in order to use them for a relevance that they want to talk about, period. They do not allow the context to stay within the word of God. Jesus' earthly ministry through his life, for we, we only have information on about 33 years, and most of what we know pertains really to the last three and a half years. But during his ministry, well, it's during his life you see a direct parallel with the nation of Israel. That the physical nature of what Israel had gone through is going to be what Jesus goes through. Both were born of supernatural power by God. You have Abram and Sarah who were both well beyond their years of having children. But yet, Sarah gave birth to Isaac. Mary and Joseph, uh, together Mary gave uh, a virgin, having conceived by the Holy Spirit, gave birth to Jesus. Both children were children of promise. Isaac in, in uh, Genesis 15, 4, one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. Jesus, from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Well, we know that Solomon built the temple. Solomon sat upon that throne in the physical sense, and he lasted only 40 years. 
but it is Jesus who is going to build that temple. It is Jesus who's going to bring in that kingdom. And it will last forever. We see in Isaac, uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. Again, land given, a son given. We see the mercies of God in giving forth something, not, not all in pieces, not something that we have to put together, but rather it is a gift that he is going to bestow upon us in its completeness. We don't have to put it together. We don't need to go and find instructions to actually have something concrete to prove it. He's just going to give it to us. Israel is called out of Egypt, out of slavery, under the control of Pharaoh, who was the government at that time in Egypt. And there was nothing noble about being an a, a, a Israelite slave in Egypt. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah um, in the days of Herod the king. And it was decreed by Caesar Augustus that a census be taken. It was the government which caused Mary and Joseph to be in Bethlehem, giving birth to Jesus in a manger. Nothing noble about his birth. Both the nation of Israel and Jesus were almost killed in their infancy. Exodus 1.22, Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you are to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. Matthew 2.13, Now when they, came, when they had gone, uh, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up. Take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. Hosea 11.1 1. When understood in what God was truly saying, it, or uh, when taken at its face value, it certainly sounds like the nation of Israel, but it can also be applied to Jesus. Where it says, when Israel was a young, was a, was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Matthew 2.15, he, Jesus, remained there in Egypt until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what was spoken of uh, by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I will call my son. A clear parallel here, a physical nation going through physical events to come to a physical land. And Jesus the Son of God going through those same steps to bring us into a spiritual land. Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt through the waters of the Red Sea. Having passed through the sea, they wandered through the wilderness for 40 days. That is our first, the first exodus. Taking the Israelites out of slavery out of Egypt through the water by means of the first Passover. The slaying of a lamb and placing the blood on the doorposts which allowed death to pass over those houses. Jesus, when he began his ministry, he came to the River Jordan where he was baptized by John the Baptist. And when he came out of the water, uh, the Holy Spirit came upon him and a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. After Jesus' baptism, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus was preparing to lead his exodus. The second exodus, as Luke uh, tells us in 931, while he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, who, appearing in glory, were speaking of his departure, which, was about to, uh, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Here, the word departure in the Greek means exodus. Jesus was going to lead his people into the, uh, out of sin and death, away from the law that had been given them, that bound them and confined them. Jesus becomes the Lamb of God slain on the cross where his blood, when applied to us, is the remission of sins and allows death to pass over us. To whomever has faith, that, that death never occurs. There are many, many other examples of the parallels of Jesus and Israel. Physical land and a spiritual kingdom.
God's people, Israel, were in a relationship with God while they were in the land. Being in that land, they had the life and relationship with God as long as that covenant was broken. When it was broken, it was severed, um, and God's wrath came upon them. They understood it to be the day of the Lord when God's judgment fell upon them. And when they were cast out of God's presence, they, they found themselves being dead to the things of God. As Adam was in the garden, he had life with God. When he was cast out, he was dead. A, a, Abra, Adam had broken that relationship with God. Jesus sets the example of his life as that true Israel that was going to be given to us. It is no longer a particular piece of land that provides life for us. It is that relationship with God. It's being in Christ, the true Israel of God. Never forget, the physical comes first and then the spiritual. But it never goes back to that physical again. We have that glorious physical I mean, the glorious spiritual today. Don't cast it away looking for the physical. There was never righteousness, peace, and joy found in the land. But when you enter into the kingdom of God, into the body of Christ, you will find righteousness, peace, and joy. Romans 14, 17 tells us, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. I submit to you that we simply need to, uh, that the sample that was, the example that was given to us by Israel's uh, call into the land is something that we can take examples from and learn from, but it is the fact and the truth that it's been fulfilled in the spiritual for us. Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, mentions in the first chapter, in him, or in Christ, ten times. He speaks of a body that comes together, Jew and Gentile, all through um, the saving work of Jesus to enter into the body of Christ. Romans 6, 3, and 3, 6, 3 through 11 says, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. If, for if we have become united with him in likeness of his death, certainly we shall, shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection." Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be sla slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Christ. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over him, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive in Christ Jesus. Paul's example here is that through faith, through the baptism of Jesus Christ, we are joined to him in his death. You know, as 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 pastor, I've had the, the privilege and the honor of officiating over different um, ceremonies, occasions, uh, weddings, um, funerals, uh, dedication, baptism. But I'll tell you, baptism has got to be my most favorite out of all of them. Um, when you see that a person is, who's come to Christ submits themselves publicly before people to say, yes, Christ is my Lord and Savior. And I want to set the example that's spoken of in Scripture in going into the water to show that I have died with Him. And that as I come up out of that water, I have been raised with Him. Jesus' body was the only resurrected body that needed to be because we enter into His resurrection. When his body came out, 
we take part in that as well. And there is no more glorious statement, a proving fact of what salvation is all about. Dying to ourself with Christ, rising again anew in the life of, of, of God. It, it's an incredible ceremony and, and uh, one that I, I treasure deeply. Okay. Ephesians 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. The scriptures speak clearly of a corporate body that is in Christ, the church. His body manifested to the people of this world as the Israelites were supposed to be the light to the nations around them. We are called to be that light. We are called to be the body of Christ to show the <coughs> teachings of who Jesus is. And if we unfortunately teach that he's only accomplished part of what he came to do, we're not speaking of his true glory. It's when we can proclaim that he has faithfully fulfilled all that he has promised, all that he has given, that's when we truly bring him honor and glory. The new covenant makes it possible that we have that restored relationship with God. Through faith, by grace, we take part in being in Christ. I submit to you that within the book of Revelation, that Jesus Christ is clearly revealed. Isn't that what it's about? Revealing who our Lord and Savior truly is. I mean, we can say, oh, we're going to have all these calamities, we're going to have these wars, we're going to have this. And, and unfortunately, it diminishes the revelation of who Jesus Christ is. It only shows a portion of him. And, in, and to the world, it shows a God who doesn't, it seems to be fractured from his people. He seems to be separate. But in fact, he's truly here with us. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. When he returned to wipe out the temple in 70 AD, defeating that old covenant system, taking it away, wiping it out, one's a system that had been in store, in store for so long, but yet that God would take it away to show anew that we who are in Christ have this newness of life. He eliminated that old system and completely established the new. During Jesus' ministry, he taught using parables. And when he did, he would conclude many times by saying, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus said this to reverse what was being said in Isaiah chapter 6, 9, where uh, he said, God telling Isaiah, Go and tell the people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Jesus came as the light into the world to show what we can understand. So long as we have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. And that message is victory in Jesus Christ. Uh, come, partake of that tree of life. In Revelation 22, 2, uh, because of that tree, whether you're in the garden partaking of it back in Genesis or in Revelation when you partake of the tree of life. That tree is Jesus Christ. He promises a life that is eternal. You know, we were talking this morning in our uh, study and talking about the afterlife a little bit. And I was hoping to hear something. You know, like, yeah, I get a harp or we get to do these special things and we're going to have a great time. And, but the scriptures don't say anything about it. They really don't. But I think there's a reason for that. And it's just like the, the, the life of, of Abraham when he was called out of Ur. He wasn't given a plan and, and a, a book to show what route he was going to take or what riches he would encounter and the things that he would have. It is done by faith. We enter into a saving faith in Jesus Christ and wherever he takes us, we know that his promises are true, that we will have eternal life. Whatever that may entail, it's going to be great. Being in Christ allows us to be joined with him through that burial and resurrection. 
and the saints of God who have ears to hear and eyes to see, you will see the rich, glorious things that he has in store for us. It is our bodies will pass away. Death will come upon the, the, the physical. They wear down, they pass away. But it is the spiritual that lasts forever. You now enter into Christ, into those new heavens, into the new earth, into his glorious kingdom. Isaiah in, uh, writes in chapter 40, 30 and 31, Though youth grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Well, praise God, we no longer have to wait. We have that today. Enter into the body of Christ, and you have eternal life that does not grow weary. We have a victorious king. He has come with his kingdom, and he has established it. And today, for those who have ears to hear and eyes to see, you too can enter into that kingdom through faith in Jesus Christ and partake in it forever. Amen.